perspectives on a common issue, which has to do with how the natural systems that we're dealing with, how can we manage them to foster the greatest, greatest resilience in the face of, of, of a time on this planet where change is affecting all of us, not, not the least of which those natural resources that we're dependent upon, and the role of local people in the management and utilization of those resources, whether they're agriculture or renewable natural resources from, from wild systems or uh, if you will, planted grapes <laughs> in your systems. So that is where, that's the aegis of, of this workshop. And I would like through the course of this workshop to come back to those two points, resilience in the systems we're working with, the stewardship of those systems, and most importantly, who those stewards are. And with that little introduction, uh, stage setter, I would like to uh, proceed with introducing, I guess I should say that there will be three sections to it, obviously following on, on the three presentations, each, each crafted by the, by the uh, sponsors of those different visions, uh, but with a common thread. And um, we're going to start with looking at resilience uh, in natural landscapes, then look at small, smallholder plant farmers, and how they're dealing with climate change. And then we're going to look at how agricultural systems are important in conserving biodiversity and sustaining ecosystem services. That's sort of the pattern we'll, we'll, we'll pursue. We'll then have a moment of, of uh, a question and answer, facilitated discussion, if you will, and then we'll wrap it up. And as we go through this, I'm going to ask the speakers as well as the audience don't just don't just focus on the what <coughs> we're doing, but think about how we can go forward with these ideas. Whether we need to augment them, whether we need to address con controversy that may may occur in, in these systems or between different perspectives, uh, but it's not the what just the what that we want to conclude with. But how do we go forward? What are the facilities of the vehicles we might want to use to actually uh, carry these ideas forward? And with that, I would like to move on to introduce Angela Montgomery, who will be speaking on management of mountain, or mountain landscapes to sustain a water supply for local farmers. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Steve, for inviting me to participate in this event. I will share with you some experiences that we got from a project in Colombia, and uh, trying to learn from these experiences, uh, especially regarding how can uh, farming systems could be uh, a way that, uh, to to help in understanding the vulnerability of an area, how they can contribute to improving the ecosystem services of the watershed, um, which is important for us because it's the watershed that provides most of the water <coughs> that is being used in Bogota, the capital of Colombia. And some of these results are um, include the. Um, Part of the achievement, so the first national adaptation program in Colombia that was implemented by the Colombian government and with the support of CI Colombia. So uh, this project started seven years ago and the project development objective was to support Colombian efforts to, to define and implement specific adaptation measures and policy options to meet the anticipated impacts of climate change. And uh, one of the, of the specific components of this uh, project were trying to, to increase the resilience and reduce vulnerability of high mountain ecosystems, farming systems and communities. And some of the specific objectives were oriented to improve understanding of the behavior of high mountain tropical ecosystems and explore the suitability of um, 
agroforestry systems that are resilient to climate change. So, uh, what is important to know is that uh, in Colombia, high mountain ecosystems are highly vulnerable to climate change. These areas, if they just cover about 4% of the whole um, country, but mo more than 70% of the people of Colombia depend on the ecosystem services provided by these areas. And uh, these areas are highly vulnerable to extreme events, and these days we have a, a, an increase in, in, in events like uh, health storms, droughts, changes in the intensity and frequency of precipitation. So that makes it very important for us to start working on these ecosystems. And uh, we selected uh, as a um, study area the watershed of Rio Blanco, that is a small watershed that, uh, in which only we have just 15,000 people living there, but um, they are in an area that is not far from Bogota, and Bogota depends highly on the uh, production of water in, in this area. So one of the key points was uh, how can we build resilience in these agricultural farms? In this area, we have a, a this is the watershed, and uh, we have uh, started uh, studying the current farming systems and analyzing them, considering ecological, economic, social, and cultural aspects. And we analyze all these farming systems and we identify the main vulnerabilities of these farming systems regarding not only climate change, but also considering a, a kind of integrated vulnerability assessment. And we consider some of the aspects that are um, a characteristic of, of the climate change uh, um, vulnerability analysis, in which we analyze exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, but we also consider other threats that are occurring in the area, and that is very important because when we are working in an area, we need to be aware of the current um, land use and all the cumulative uh, aspects that are affecting the landscape. There, we arrive to to uh, we produce a map and where we have indicated the different uh, vulnerabilities of the territory. Then uh, the adaptation actions that we selected in, in, in that area uh, were we identify actions that are implemented at farm level. So there we have actions like uh, promoting agroecological practices for soil and water management, the implementation of agroforestry systems, Particip participative ecological restoration and conservation of key areas for the maintenance of ecosystem services. But also what is important is that to, to maintain these actions in the long term, we need also to work uh, in different kinds of actions. For example, we need to support uh, the, and to develop and update the current land use plans at the municipal and, and farm level capacity building and research. So these kind of actions are, really, uh, are quite important to, to guarantee that the adaptation actions that are implemented at farm level can be uh, sustainable in the long term. And in addition to that, we have also some actions that may guarantee that these actions has, are, can also be sustained. And uh, it's, for example, the, we develop some guidelines for uh, farming systems adaptation in high mountain ecosystems that could be applied in similar ecosystems in the country, and also um, other policy actions at the national level. Some of the results that we got, we uh, start working um, in, in farm management, and we developed some interesting uh, actions in NITO pilots, uh, where we establish, for example, um, home gardens for the propagation of native species, agroecological practices, farm plants that are agreements signed by local communities in which the land use changes are guaranteed in the long term. And also we implemented technologies for the efficient uh, use of water, technologies for soil management, and also what uh, is strengthening the food production chain and marketing. And there are also some uh, mitigation co-benefits, uh, for example, soil restoration and conservation, uh, polycultures and carbon, soil fixation increase, cattle uh, actions for cattle 
for management, actions for biodiversity conservation, for example, building connectivity, conservation of, of uh, agro-biodiversity, and developing new income possibilities for the local population. So uh, then we come to some lessons learned that are useful for, for this discussion, and it's how can we start understanding the the, the development of, of resilience in these agro ecosystems. So what we found out is that uh, we have to start with integrated vulnerability assessments, in, uh, integrating the analysis and considering all aspects in an integrated manner. Also, considering that vulnerability increases with non-sustainable management practices, and that is very common in, in this type of agricultural landscapes. Uh, to analyze our ecosystems in an integrated way. Um, also, to see that resilience should be aligned with food security and land use planning goals. Otherwise, we cannot sustain these actions in, in, a, in, in the landscape. Um, to to yeah, be aware that adaptation is a matter of social and economic development. Uh, the importance of considering that the uh, pilot adaptation projects in our ecosystems is a learning by doing ac uh, activity and it's a long-term process that depends on research, the participation of local communities and also the recognition of traditional knowledge. Um, the importance of evaluation of agroecological process and the importance of uh, uh, strengthening in the local institutions. And this is one of the key aspects that we found out that are important for, for the future. And uh, we had some conclusions that were oriented to more to climate change activities, but it's, it's important to, to know them. Because um, in many cases, when we implement this kind of projects, we are um, uh, addressing uh, climate change impacts uh, in, in areas that are highly vulnerable. And one of the main points these days is how can we integrate mitigation and adaptation actions. So for, uh, as a conclusion of this uh, uh, project, we found out that uh, it's quite important to start integrating mitigation and adaptation actions at farm level and, uh, and, and see the connections of, of both activities in order to guarantee that maladaptation is, is not uh, a side uh, effect, let's say, of, of implementation of any mitigation action. Um, we found out that we, is, we are lacking of a, a more empirical studies and more research to explore these linkages between mitigation and maladaptation in, in agricultural landscapes. And we also need to understand more uh, better the carbon and water cycle and to understand the co-benefits of, of this um, either of adaptation or mitigation activities at landscape level. Um, we know that the uh, agroforestry, for example, they, they are eligible under the CDM, and there is a quite interesting opportunity to develop synergies uh, at landscape level. But so there is an opportunity to do that. Also, um, mainstreaming adaptation and mitigation can occur at project scale, and um, the inclusion of adaptation requirements in the CDM or in Red Plus or facilitating the access of, of a system-based adaptation project to mitigation funding. Um, the connection of climate change mitigation and adaptation with other uh, agreements, international agreements related to, to forest biodiversity and others. And um, important to, to address either uh, adaptation and mitigation in an integrated manner in such a way that at farm and, and at local level they, there are more synergies than, than contradictions. So with these kind of examples, I think that uh, that's a way to, to start contributing with the discussion. And uh, of course we know that we just address part of the, of the, um, of the problems that are happening in, the, in this watershed. But uh, these areas, as we know, are so vulnerable that uh, we really need to start working uh, in order to reduce the vulnerability and guarantee that the local people can, can be uh, included in the whole, uh, strategies of adaptation and also that uh, the relation that the, these actions have with the provision of ecosystem services 
that um, are quite important, as I already mentioned, because they provide the water to to cities like Bogota, and otherwise they will be uh, really yeah very much affected by climate change. Thank you. And now it's Scott and Barlow um, to speak to resilience and the social logical components of this Neander Forest and Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. eyes shutting, I'll go with a very deep voice. Just be aware. Right. I'm going to take you back in time to I'll tell you a little story, but with a tweak. I'm going to put a resilience frame around it. It's a story of what happened in the region of Tanzania called Shinyanga. It's got about 800 villages, two and a half million people. In 1985, then President Julius Nyerere declared Shinyanga the desert of the country. And as a result of that, a whole program was born called Defadi Arthi Shinyanga, which means soil conservation in Shinyanga. 